also has worked with the National Park Service and helped design the monitoring protocols and implement these monitoring pro protocols for all of the Hawaii National Parks. She has a job, a real job, <laughs> across the street in the um, Curriculum Research and Development Group with Kenisa and Duncan Serafin. And today is um, the culmination of her master's thesis. She has written a tremendous research paper that is bound for um, getting out there to a journal or more um, but before the end of this year. And it's a pleasure to have read that paper. It's, I promise you, a very interesting and enjoyable time as she gives the presentation of this research. But because I know it's a done deal, <laughs> we can nice start to start with this. <laughs> Just wanted your parents to see it. <laughs> so, good luck and enjoy. <laughs> Tell me if you want the lights off or on. It looks fine right now. Okay, good. Okay, good. So thank you all for coming and being on time, even though I'm not on time. Uh, so I, today I'll be talking about um, a work that I did as an RA under... Cindy and Celia uh, in 2008 with the movement and dietary preference of the sea urchin Trichnisius gratilla uh, patch reef in Hawaii. So Kaneohe Bay Oahu is the site of one of the most well-documented phase shifts here in Hawaii. Phase shifts are associated with economic loss as well as reduced reef biodiversity. This is due to the degradation of the reef habitat, as you can see here, a loss of reef complexity leads to um, a loss of shelter oftentimes due to algal overgrowth and shading. Phase shifts can be caused by the overgrowth or invasion of both native and alien algal species. For instance, the native algae Dictyosphera cavernosa aided initially by sewage outfall in Kaneohe Bay and then subsisted by low grazing intensity after the sewage was diverted, has overgrown and contributed to the mortality of hard corals in the bay. There's also three prominent alien species that have become established, Acanthophora sativa, Saphophagus eukema species complex, as well as Grappularia falcornia. <coughs> Significant declines in coral cover has been especially attributed to these two. They're really sturdy, three-dimensional, and that morphology allows them to overgrow and shade and some other hard corals. Just a note on Capophycus eukema in particular. I'm going to be calling this Capophycus mostly because it's a mouthful to say the Capophycus eukema species complex every time this comes up. Um, and this is really sort of, this species really demonstrates that the negative impacts of native and of both negative Sorry, the negative impacts of native and alien species both are invasive and both are detrimental, but because alien species often um, are released from predation and competition, it leads to different morphologies, such as Kyphophycus. It doesn't look like this necessarily in its native environment. So the management of alien algal species is confounded by the displacement of native released from competition, and avoidance by native predators, in particular herbivores and archaea. So in Kaneohe Bay, the current per spread cover and persistence of these invasive species indicates that the current level of herbivory is lower than necessary to control the growth of this macroalgae. Invasive algae once established are difficult and costly to eradicate. Solutions proposed to reduce the abundance include reducing nutrient input, implementing or better enforcing fishing regulations, chemical control, physical removal, and biological control. These solutions are challenging to implement for a number of reasons. For instance, reducing nutrient input, particularly in Kaneohe Bay, where it's a very large watershed, that means that the guidelines governing nutrients would have to be implemented the watershed. Fishing is thought to reduce the average size and numbers of herbivorous fish in the bay, and fishing management and enforcement of funding is often inadequate. Hawaii also has a very strong recreational fishing industry. 
industry and lobby, and such restrictions are often difficult to institute and enforce. Chemical control of invasive species has been successful in reducing and eradicating some infestations. However, most of these have been done in temperate areas with soft bottoms, and they've been very small to scale or with low built habitat complexity. In tropical regions such as Hawaii, chemical eradication poses more of a risk perhaps to native species, and so the permitting process uh, may be prohibitive. I'm gonna talk a little bit more over the next couple of slides about physical removal, particularly here in Hawaii. Physical removal of invasive algae is slow, labor intensive, and may increase the risk of spread by fragmentation during removal. And fragmentation is a way that many algae species spread. So for example, from 2002 to 2007, Waikiki community volunteers moved over 100 tons of Brisbane Grassleria California from the fringing reefs by hand. And although the amount of biomass is substantial, the fringing reefs and back reefs were being never got cleared, and they have not reported to have positively affected nearby reefs. Volunteer algae removal efforts, often difficult to organize, require a long-term management commitment, and are generally limited to the near shore environment. However, even though as perhaps an ecological benefit we haven't seen, it was very persuasive in terms of getting community and political awareness and support for alien algae. And because of that, as a result, there was funding in 2004 to build a barge-mounted mobile vacuum device, also called the Super Sucker, to increase the efficiency of invasive algae removal. The Super Sucker is operated by the Hawaii's um, Aquatic Invasive Species Team, which is under the Division of Aquatic Resources in the Department of Land and Natural Resources, the LNR. These groups have partnered with the University of Hawaii and the Nature Conservancy to both manage and operate the Super Sucker. It first began operations in 2004. You can see here that divers manually remove invasive algae from the reef and feed it into the super sucker via this hose here, which goes onto a barge where it's sorted and bagged and used as fertilizer for local farmers. In 2010, the super sucker removed over 98,000 pounds of invasive algae in Kenya Bay. The super sucker has been shown to dramatically reduce the cover of invasive algae, which is great to show with pictures like this some before and after shots. However, while super sucker operation is certainly less labor intensive than the Waikiki community effort with all of those people, it still has overhead costs, including staff salaries, boat usage, and maintenance and repair. In addition, it appears that cleared reefs, particularly in unprotected areas, need to be revisited to maintain a low alcohol I'd like to talk about biological control a little bit more. So biological control is the reliance upon native or natural enemies to control pests. It is often viewed as controversial because introducing non-native species to control alien species can have some very negative unintended consequences. We're all familiar with the cane toad in Australia or the mongoose here in Hawaii. However, enhancing native herbivores may alleviate some of those concerns that arise over species introductions. In Kaneohe Bay, Conklin and Simpson actually enhanced the native herbivorous fish population on pat trees by transplanting fish from pat trees to pat trees. This artificially enhanced those numbers, but via immigration or mortality, fish did not remain in transplanted areas. This might have been due to the low habitat complexity of the degraded reefs, which offer little shelter. So, enhancing the population of a sea urchin might be more effective. So, Tripnusius scatilla has been offered up as a biological <coughs> control agent for invasive macroalgae here in Hawaii. It's native, it has limited mobility, particularly when you compare it to fish. It's conspicuous on the reefs, and 